distinguished citizens of Portsmouth and my colleagues on City Council. Welcome to our council meeting on Tuesday, May 9th. Call the meeting to order. If we could all stand for a moment of silence and then we will have the Pledge of, Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would ask all my colleagues on council to please note your presence electronically. Seven members of city council are present. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And we do have the minutes of a called meeting on April 25th, 2023, and a regular meeting on April 25th, 2023. Are there any changes to the minutes? We need a second uh, motion and a second. We have adoption. Second. I would ask all my colleagues to vote electronically. The minutes are adopted 7-0. Thank you, ma'am. Madam Clerk, would you please read the council rules? Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, city council rules require a limit of up to five minutes to speak. As you approach the speaker's podium, you would notice the timer. At the beginning of your five minutes, you will see a green light. Four minutes into your remarks, you will notice a yellow light. At the end of five minutes, you will see a red light here beep, and we ask that you conclude your comments at that time. While speakers have an opportunity to address council on matters of public concern, all comments should be made in a manner that respects the seriousness of the forum and should not be made in a belligerent, sarcastic, or demeaning fashion. All remarks shall be directed to the city council as a body rather than to any particular member of city council, staff, or the audience, and should be limited to matters that only the Portsmouth City Council can influence. A speaker who fails to observe this basic rule of decorum will be deemed out of order and not allowed to conclude his or her comments. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We've now come to item on our agenda public hearing, item 23-164. And Madam Clerk, would you please read the public hearing item? Yes, sir. Public hearing on proposed real property <laughs> tax increase. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Citizens of Portsmouth, this is a public hearing. <coughs> In order for you to come forward and speak on this item, you are not required to have signed up prior to. So if there is anyone in the audience at this time who wishes to come to speak on this public hearing item, please come forward, state your name, address, and you will have five minutes. Seeing none, this public hearing is closed. We're now moving to the city manager's report. Item 23-165. And Madam Clerk, would you please read the information for the city manager's report? Yes, sir. Item A, adoption to amend, excuse me, ordinance to amend and reenact re ordinance number 22-32 to impose and levy taxes for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2023 and ending June 30th, 2024 on real estate, tangible personal property, privately owned pleasure boats, privately owned camping trailers and motorhomes and machinery and tools within the city of Portsmouth, Virginia for the purpose of raising revenue for the support of governmental operations and the public free, sco public free schools and to pay principal and interest on public debt. Thank you, ma'am. Do we have a motion and a second? Move for adoption. Second. Is there any additional discussion on this item? Seeing none, I'm asking all my colleagues to vote electronically. This item is adopted. He didn't vote. We got to do it over. Stop pushing the button. Everyone, would you please vote again electronically? 
This item is adopted 6-1. Madam Clerk, would you please read the next ordinance? Yes, sir. We're item, considering. Item B, an ordinance to amend Appendix A of the Code of the City of Portsmouth, Virginia to increase rates for water and sewage services as authorized by Sections 38-83 and 38-117 of said code. Thank you, ma'am. Do we have a motion and a second? Move for adoption. Second. Is there any additional discussion on this item? Seeing none, please vote electronically. <laughs> I hit the wrong button. I wanted yes. Can we please vote again? We're on this? putting it up again for you to vote. This item, thank you. This item is adopted 6 1. Thank you, ma'am. Madam Clerk, would you please read the next ordinance we are considering? Item C. An ordinance to amend Appendix A of the Code of the City of Portsmouth. Virginia to increase monthly stormwater utility fees as of July 1, 2023, as authorized by Section 31.2-26 of said code. Thank you, ma'am. We are in need of a motion and a second. We have adoption. Second. Is there any additional discussion on this item? Please vote electronically. This item is adopted 6-1. Thank you, ma'am. Could you read, could, excuse me, could you please read the ordinance that we are considering for the next item? Yes, sir. Item D. Uh, item D, yes, ma'am. An ma ordinance to amend and reordain sections 19-150, 20-7, 38-48, 38-86, and Appendix A, and to establish a new article... 16 mm -hmm. of <laughs> chapter 22 <laughs> of the Code of the City of Portsmouth, Virginia, for the purpose of establishing, rescinding, or modifying rates and fees for museum admissions, alcoholic beverages license, for casino restaurants, initiation and transfer of water service, and violations of posted speed limits and school zones or highway work zones as evidenced by photo speed monitoring devices. Thank you, ma'am. And we do have a speaker, a registered speaker on this item, item D, and Mr. Mark godaldig yutrovsky sir. If you would come forward, state your name and address. You will have five minutes. Good evening, mayor, council, and other neighbors. Um, I have covered some of this during the public hearings. I don't want to repeat what I've said previously, but I do want to note that this is where I would expect to have seen the increases in a variety of parking fees had, had they been uh, coming for approval. So by inference, then I want to thank you all for having been responsive to the ob objections that I raised in my previous addresses to you. Um, also, I did not touch on the speed camera uh, part of this. And I want to say that I am enthusiastic at the idea that people will not be able to break the speed limit with impunity. This has been a major aggravation, especially during the pandemic, when I've seen more wild and crazy driving than at any time before. So the fact that you can use cameras to catch and to uh, levy sanctions against people who go more than 10 miles an hour over the speed limits in school zones 
and in highway work zones during the hours that they are in effect, I believe will be a great benefit. I'm glad that the General Assembly has finally given localities the authority to do this kind of enforcement, and I'm hoping to see some improvement in terms of compliance with the law with an increased certainty that there would be uh, people apprehended or people put on notice that they've been caught doing it and sanctioned for it. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We are in need. Uh, we already have uh, a motion and a second. No. Move adoption. Right, 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 right. We second. are in need of a motion and a second. Move adoption. Second. Is there any additional discussion on this item? Seeing none, please vote electronically. This item is adopted 7-0. We have now come to item E. Madam Clerk, would you please read the resolution we are considering pertaining to this item? Yes, sir. A resolution approving the Community Planning and Development 2024 Annual Action Plan of the City of Portsmouth, Virginia, and authorizing the City Manager to file documents required to obtain the City's Community Planning and Development Grant entitlements. Thank you, ma'am. Council members, we are in need of a motion and a second. Move to adopt. Second. Is there any additional discussion on this item? Seeing none, would you please vote electronically? This item is adopted 7-0. Thank you, ma'am. We have now come to item F. And Madam Clerk, would you please read the ordinance that we are considering pertaining to this item? An ordinance adopting the FY 2024 classification and pay plan for employees of the city of Portsmouth, Virginia. Thank you, ma'am. We do have a registered speaker for this particular item, and that speaker is Mr. Mark Godaldig Yutrovsky. Mr. Yutrovsky, sir, if you come forward, state your name and address. You will have five minutes. Good evening again, Mayor, Council, and other neighbors. Um, so in this instance, you've heard this before. I have written to you what my objections are about it. And I just want to ensure that, that this argument gets aired in this public forum. Uh, provision eight of the ordinance that you are, that you have before you includes a supplement a one-time payment to participants in the city's closed retirement plans and a health-related uh, supplement for those in the police and fire uh, retirement plan. I believe that the plans as they exist, as they are constituted, provide adequate recompense to the retirees who participate in them. And while I have no, I have no bad feelings for people who advocate for themselves, who feel that they should receive more than they are receiving. I reserve my hard feelings for elected officials who do not consider the good of the whole as opposed to the good of a few. I do not believe that these supplements serve the public interest. I believe, in fact, there is a detriment because a dollar spent here, or in this case, a million and a half or so dollars spent here, cannot be used elsewhere in the budget. 
And I don't believe that's right. I don't believe that's the correct prioritization. So you, have, you did receive email from me yesterday, which included uh, not, not just a very detailed PowerPoint about the pension plans and the HRA, but you received a number of newspaper articles from several years, mostly around 2013, describing what the actual benefits of these plans are. So it's not just my say-so. You have documentation on which to base an informed judgment. I ask you to reject that provision. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We are in need of a motion and a second. Move adoption. Second. Is there any additional discussion on this item? Seeing none, um, I would ask everyone to vote electronically. This item is approved 5-2. Madam Clerk, would you please read item G the, and, and read the information um, relate, um, excuse me, would you please read the ordinance that we are considering pertaining to this item? Yes, sir, an ordinance approving the FY 2024 through 2028 capital improvement program and appropriating $77,834,000 in the FY 2024 capital improvement fund subject to receipt of the means of financing designated hearing. Thank you, ma'am. And we do have a registered speaker for this item, and it is Mark Godaldig Yutrovsky. Mr. Yutrovsky, if you would please come forward, state your name and address, sir, and you will have five minutes. Thank you. One last time, Mr. Mayor, council members, and other neighbors. Um, I realized after I spoke in the public hearings on capital improvement that there were two other items that I wanted you to consider. Perhaps they won't make the cut this year because this is a balanced budget. You don't print your own money as they do in Washington. Uh, but still, I wanted to put them out there as markers. So one, if you are contemplating refurbishing parking meters, um, I would rather that you change the system to where you have zoned pay stations, you have marked spots on the streets for your on-street parking, and you have a box at which people render their payments. Um, the advantages are clear. Not a lot of people carry a lot of change anymore. Change is one of those things that has become uh, kind of a rare commodity in today's economy. And the ability of somebody to swipe a credit card to pay for parking on street increases the likelihood that people will pay. If I don't have the change, I say, well, I'll risk it. What the heck? Maybe I won't get caught. The other piece is with the problems at the wind waste uh, handling center. They are not in operation. SIPSA is having to carry extra loads to the landfill in Suffolk because of uh, what seems to be a total meltdown of that facility. And Portsmouth has relied on that facility as our transfer station for the dropping off of, of waste collected at curbside and then put on tractor trailers to be hauled to the landfill. So our ability to 
perform this basic essential function is uh, called into question right now with the situation being what it is. So I would say it's not too early to be finding a way to address the transfer issue. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We are in need of a motion and a second. Move to adopt. Second. Is there any additional discussion on this item? Seeing none, I would ask everyone to vote electronically. This item is adopted 7-0. We have now come to item H. And Madam Clerk, would you please read the ordinance we are considering pertaining to this item? Yes, sir. An ordinance to provide taxpayers with the real estate tax relief in the form of a credit in the amount of five cents per $100 as assessed value to be applied to each quarterly real estate tax bill issued for fiscal year 2024. Thank you, ma'am. Council members, we are in need of a motion and a second. Move adoption. Second. Is there any additional discussion on this item? Seeing none, would you please vote electronically? This item is adopted 7-0. We have now come to item I. And Madam Clerk, would you please read the ordinance that we are considering pertaining to this item? Yes, sir. An ordinance approving the fiscal year 2024 operating budget for the Porson Public School System in the amount of $247,532,427 and appropriating the necessary funds to implement said budget for the fiscal year 2024. Thank you, ma'am. We are in need of a motion and a second. Move for approval. Second. Is there any additional discussion on this item? Seeing none, would you please vote electronically? This item is adopted 7-0. Thank you, ma'am. Item J. And Madam Clerk, would you please read the ordinance that we are considering pertaining to this item? And an ordinance to appropriate $520,483,988 for the operation of city government during the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2023. Thank you, ma'am. We're in need of a motion and a second. Move adoption. Second. Is there any additional discussion on this item? Seeing none, would you please vote electronically? This item is adopted 7-0. Thank you, ma'am. We have now come to new business on our agenda. Item 23-166, boards and commissions. Mr. Moody, are there any boards and commissions to consider at this time? None to announce tonight, Mayor. Thank you, sir. Item 23-167, items submitted by council members. Dr. Whitaker, sir, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Two items uh, for council um, and their report back issues, and the one pertains to the report back that we received from the city attorney uh, in regards to the Sugar Hill property. And again, we see that there's uh, quite a bit of transactions that are taking place. Um, I'm asking if there's no objection from council uh, that our city attorney um, would uh, seek the uh, advice and guidance and also direction on the historical context of what happened with Sugar Hill um, by contacting the noted historian of this area, Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander at Norfolk State University uh, to give us a context as to these transactions um, that you're reporting on because um, as written, it just gives uh, isolated uh, legal transactions. We don't see what's happening historically at those times. And I think that's very important for council to be aware of uh, as we continue to look at this issue. All right. And, and the second is um, for the city assessor's report back. I have a question 
on the report back that uh, you gave us uh, regarding uh, the golf course. Dr. Whitaker, sir, would you like for the assessor to come forward? Yes. Ma'am, um, Ms. Culpepper, if you could come forward, please. Ms. Culpepper, at our last council meeting and the discussion on the um, golf course, Elizabeth Minor, you mentioned that the land for golf courses, um, the land is tax exempt. And in your report back that you submitted to us, uh, you reported that um, they paid taxes through, I believe it was the third quarter of this year. So which one is it? If, if, if you're saying they're exempt, then why is there a tax payment they are being made? exempt from the um, rate that other land is exempt at. They do pay taxes based on CLAC. The information that comes from the Commonwealth. Ms. Culpepper, ma'am, could you talk and speak into the microphone? Yes, sir, I beg Thank your you. Uh, what I, and I did misspoke, misspoke to you regarding that because I said that they were, were not taxed. They are not taxed at the rate that normally would be paid. Some of the other land at the golf course is taxed at a different rate. But because of the open space agreement that has been executed between the city of Portsmouth and Elizabeth Manor Golf Course, the Commonwealth of Virginia allows them to be taxed at the open space rate. They gave us a range of rates between $1,500 and $2,000. Right. I don't know who selected the $2,000 rate, but it was selected and that's what's included in our rate. They have, I believe it's 140.3 acres that is taxed at uh, $2,000 per acre. And they do, pay, they do pay taxes on that amount. So the open space agreement that the city entered into with Elizabeth Minor, um, that starts back around what, the 1970s, I believe? And the report that you gave only gives uh, a report on what they paid this quarter. Um, no objection from council. I would like for you to report to council what the taxes on that 140 acres, what was the net, the net taxes paid on the 140 acres of land while that property was under the open space agreement um, that goes back several years and what the fair market value of that property is. I will be glad to, okay. uh, Dr. Whitaker, if the documents are available to me, I'm not sure that they are, uh, but I will be glad to look and see. I have the open space agreement that was recently signed, but I'm not sure about the others. I know that when I was here before, back in, let me see, I'm, I'm just going to guess if I may please. But if I remember correctly, it was in about 2008 or 9, there was an agreement signed. And I know that at one time that it was here, but I can't speak to it this particular time if it is. But if it's there, I'll be more than glad to make it all the information available, not just to council, but to the citizens. Anyone that would be would like to see it, I would be more than glad well, to Well, I'm, not, I'm not interested in the open space mm -hmm. agreement itself, because that probably mm -hmm. exists or it may not exist. But what does exist is over that period of time, what were the net taxes per year that that property was paying and what was the fair market value? Um, now, if there is an open space agreement during those time periods, that would be helpful, but I'm, I'm not interested in seeing all of that documentation. Well, that's, that's just a matter of okay. whether it exists or not. But as far as were they paying taxes on 140 acres of land. My second concern, which, is, which goes beyond your administration, um, is that the open space use um, law that is allowed in Virginia, that was originally allowed for rural farmland so that those farmers wouldn't have to pay the fair market value for providing a public service. And so, therefore, the cost of that real estate property, real estate tax would be passed on to consumers for a good that farmers provide to all of us. That's quite evident that that is a public good. I don't see how a private golf course, 140 acres of land in a city that is cash-strapped for real estate, 
how does this private golf course, which had exclusive membership language, become a public good that now they receive a significant decrease in the, in the uh, fair market value of their real estate? I'm, I'm concerned because other jurisdictions tax golf courses at the fair market value. How is it that Portsmouth, which needs all the tax dollars we can get, is giving this open use to a private golf course that does not allow for public openness in its membership? And so I'm concerned about that because of the history of golf courses in Portsmouth is not a good history. While I was in high school, Portsmouth had a golf course battle week which was being privately leased and was, did not allow blacks to play golf up there. And that was during my high school years. And so now we see another privilege being given with this open use. And so I said that goes beyond your administration because that's something that has been in place evidently over the years. And so I would be interested in seeing how that private golf course was able to uh, take advantage of that by us seeing historically the amount of taxes that were paid, the net, because um, I don't know just because they paid if there was an abatement or some exemptions given, because you even mentioned the exemption language. And so I would be interested in, in seeing that okay, well, uh, in I council will, as well. I will gladly get with the uh, treasurer and see what type of records he has. Okay. And I'll be glad to look through what we have. Thank and you. And be glad to report back to you. Thank you. And when you break that down, can you disaggregate it by years? and um, not give us just a gross amount. Yes, sir, if, if I am able to right. obtain the information, I'll be more than glad to. But at I, this I point would, in time, I, I can't guarantee I, that. I would, I would think that would be public record how much some you know, organization is paying in taxes. Yes, sir, I understand that, yeah. but there's a list that is issued by the Commonwealth of Virginia that tells everybody how long they must retain their records. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure where this would fall and I certainly can't speak for the treasurer's right. office on what his requirements are. But whatever that I can get, I'll be more than glad to provide. Right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Anything else, sir? Thank you. So before before we get to Mr. Moody, thank you, Ms. Culpepper. Um, Mr. Hugo, you have the floor. All right, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, two shout outs tonight. First. Um, first Saturdays of the month, had the opportunity to attend the Parker Rec Center. Uh, and there's a program that's uh, being run there that first Saturday of the month called the Youth Leadership Development Program. It's run by Dr. Mark Hayes in collaboration with our Parks and Recreation Department. And so I want to shout out to Dr. Hayes and to the Parks and Rec team. There were a dozen and a half of our young folks and two dozen parents and grandparents there just this past Saturday. And, uh, and so that program has been growing in attendance month by month. In fact, uh, one of the young men that participates in that program was uh, 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 shouted out at the state of the city by, uh, by the mayor. And so, so it's, a, it's an awesome investment uh, in uh, our up and coming leadership in the city. Uh, and I appreciate that uh, Dr. Hayes and Parks and Rec are working together to pour that into our kids. Secondly, uh, we, we uh, just finished plowing through uh, adopting ordinances that put our budget in place. Uh, I wanna shout out to the city manager and to her team uh, for being patient with those of us who ask lots of questions because lots of questions have been asked along the way about uh, the things that are in our budget. Uh, and you and, and uh, Mr. Burke in particular have been uh, uh, patiently responding to, uh, to those questions uh, in a way that's uh, allowed us insight into uh, to what's there so that as we get questions about the budget, uh, we're able to answer those. So thanks for your hard work and for the work of your team. Thanks. Councilman Tillage, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, at the last city council meeting, we had a number of citizens that came to express concern with the Harbor Court garage. 
and I was wondering if it, we could be provided with an update on what the city has done or plans to do with the secure the securing of that facility. Yes, he he will have to leave a report back. So thank you, ma'am. Um, Councilman Moody, sir, you have the floor. Thank thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilman Whitaker brought up some issues that uh, I think need to be addressed by our city attorney. One is the legality of the open space uh, exemption that's allowed by the uh, Commonwealth of Virginia. If, uh, if she could report back to us, uh, I don't know if you have information tonight, but uh, whenever that's available, uh, Madam City Attorney, I think that uh, needs to be uh, uh, answered. Uh, the implication is that something wrong is being done by uh, whomever. Uh, the other, the other situation is Elizabeth Manor, and I'm not a, I'm not a member of Elizabeth Manor, but I do know, and I think Mayor, you know, uh, that the membership is open like any uh, country club to anybody that's uh, got the money. Uh, so uh, they they. Uh, they're completely open. So the inference that somehow it harkens back to the 60s or the 50s is just not factual. So uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, sir. I just wanted to respond, Mayor. Is that okay? Yes, ma'am. You I, have I the floor. Thank you. I don't have the answer. Thank you for the um, question. I will tell you that um, um, I'm, I'm going to call you Miss Janie. Miss Culpepper uh, uh, came to me um, in my work researching this very issue at the request of council previously. Uh, we worked on this very issue with the assessor. So I am working on a report back, and so I will provide that uh, with detailed information. Um, and I will get with um, Ms. Culpepper as well uh, with that information to incorporate that in that report back. So Thank you, Madam Attorney. Working. Thank you, ma'am. Councilman Barnes, sir, you have the floor. I just wanted to give um, two shout outs. Um, first, I want to give a, a shout out to my um, AU basketball team, which, ma which is made up of a bunch of 16 year olds from the city of Portsmouth, who in the last three weeks have won three major AU basketball tournaments. So I wanted to give them a shout out for that. And also, I wanted to give a shout out to my wife, because today we are celebrating our 16th anniversary. Vice Mayor Lucas Burke. Ma'am, you have the floor. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, one of my um, requests for information was already addressed, the Harbor Towers uh, garage update, the cameras and the lighting. We had a lot of people here last meeting, and we want to uh, make sure that we can get continuous updates. Um, another request was the Court Street uh, renovations. I know uh, my colleagues have been um, bombarded with emails. Um, if you've not, I've, I've received a couple and have responded to a few uh, we had some members here from the community, and they just wanted regular updates. I think we said we were going to get them monthly. Uh, we haven't heard anything from that, but they just want a completion date. It was scheduled for six months, seven months, and now it's been over a year, almost two years. So if we can get a regular update on that, that would be appreciated as well so that we could respond back. Thank you, Vice Mayor. And I do believe that um, there was a meeting with, just to update you, with Dominion um, Energy and what they're doing. I do have some information um, relative to that and I'll share it with you tonight, okay? And I'll share it with everyone. In any event, um, our next speaker is Dr. Whitaker. Sir, yeah. you have the floor. Yes, sir. I just wanna make sure that um, my statements aren't misrepresented. The issue of open use, um, that's not an issue of any nefarious activity or wrongdoing going on. That was simply pointing out that there are private golf courses in the Commonwealth of Virginia that pay fair market value. My question is simply, how is it that Portsmouth allows for this private golf course, 140 acres in a tax strapped city, how does, how does that exist? Okay, so that's, that's nothing nefarious or wrong. Now, we do know the history of country clubs, so let, let's not try to, you know, whitewash that you whitewash Jesus enough. Let's let's not try to whitewash um, the, the country club. We, we know what it represents and what it has represented. And as I said, the history of this city 
is full of the evidence of that. So I stand on what I said. Mr. Moody, you have the floor. You know what that country club represents? Uh, yeah, I know. It, it, Since you it, asked. It, yeah, is I know. Is, it has invested $7 million uh, in, in the facility that's on the tax rolls. I think uh, Ms. Culpepper shared with us uh, at the last meeting their right. tax contribution. So they're not skating by without paying taxes. Their, their taxes are substantial. And I stand by my earlier comment. Yeah, plantation uh, had a lot of value too. Thank you, sirs. Seeing no other comments from my colleagues on council, I do have a couple of items that I wanted to share with everyone. First of all, I did want to make everyone aware of the work to, to what um, my colleague, Councilman Hugo, indicated. You know, we have to celebrate the success of our city leadership team who um, certainly put in the work uh, to do this budget, to be inclusive in this budget, to include the citizens in this budget process. And I've been on council for a number of years, and I can tell you that's the most comprehensive that I've seen the engagement during budget season in a while. So on behalf of my colleagues on council, I want to thank, first of all, um, our interim city manager, Ms. Mimi Terry, because leadership doesn't just happen. It has to be intentional, it has to be directed, and it has to show up. And the fact that we were able to, as a council, it's a lot that goes into this, and I remember my, my vice mayor telling me when I first got on council, you just wait to budget season. You haven't seen anything yet. And I tell you, the budget season can bring out the good, the bad, and the ugly. But one thing I want to say is everybody up on this dais, I really don't care how people feel about me personally. But in terms of what we're all here to do, we're all here to work on behalf of the citizens of the city of Portsmouth and do our best job for them. It doesn't always come out the way we would like. Uh, but it does come out the best way that it can. With saying that, once again, I want to congratulate you, Madam City Manager. I want to congratulate your staff, Mr. Burke. I know who's on the financial team and everybody who put in the effort, the time. This is not work in a vacuum. These people are passionate. They're concerned. They care about this city. And as I said in the state of the city, I'm not trying to build myself up, but Portsmouth is winning. And we're winning because we're working together as a team. That doesn't mean we're going to agree all the time. You know, it's like my, my, my good friend said, if you want everybody to like you, sell ice cream. <laughs> okay, so the reality is uh, we're trying to do the best we can as a team, but I did not want that to go unnoticed. We don't get here with a balanced budget without everybody. And I also want to acknowledge our city attorney's office because they put a lot of work in in getting the wording right. You know, they have to come back and forth and make sure everything that's being said is going to be the right thing to be said because it can be challenged at the end of the day. So with all of that being said, thank you to the team, Madam City Attorney, Madam City Manager, City Staff, and anybody and everybody else. And by the way, I got to say this too, our city clerk and her team do work on this behalf. It, it just doesn't all happen. And, and, and we all know, I, I share with folks that, you know, we've got an awesome city clerk and her staff. And this team is the best team I've ever worked with. And I'm proud to represent all of them as your mayor. In, in, in keeping with that theme, you know, for occasionally I get good messages from citizens, right? Occasionally. Um, so this is one I want to share. Is the chief in the house, Chief, Chief, Chief Jenkins? Are you in the building? Okay. I want to share this with you that I got from Dr. Diane Davis Wagner. Some of you know Dr. Diane Davis Wagner. Uh, she's the head of the uh, social work program at Norfolk State University and a longtime resident of the city of Portsmouth. She wrote to me, hello, Mayor Glover. Hope all is well. I wanted you to know the police chief, Chief Jenkins, gave an outstanding state-of-the-art presentation on crime prevention and activity to the Community Relations Committee. He is very professional 
and has a heart for the city. Echo that. We finally have a winner. Thank you, Chief, and thank your department for all you do. We are now going to move to item 23-168, report on pending items. Madam Manager, do you have any report on pending items? No, sir, I don't. Thank you, ma'am. Our next item is item 23-169, non-agenda speakers. And Madam Clerk, would you please read the speaker statement? Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, city council rules require a limit up to five minutes to speak. As you approach the speaker's podium, you will notice a timer. At the beginning of your five minutes, you will see a green light. Four minutes into your remarks, you will notice a yellow light. At the end of five minutes, you will see a red light, hear a beep, and we ask that you conclude your comments at that time. While speakers have an opportunity to address council on matters of public concern, all comments should be made in a manner that respects the seriousness of the forum and should not be made in a belligerent, sarcastic, or demeaning fashion. All remarks shall be directed to the city council as a body rather than to any particular member of city council, staff, or the audience, and should be limited to matters that only the Portsmouth City Council can influence. A speaker who fails to observe this basic rule of decorum will be deemed out of order and not allowed to conclude his or her comments. Thank you, ma'am. Our first speaker for the evening is Gwen Strickland. Gwen Strickland. Is Ms. Strickland with us? Okay. okay. We'll move to the next speaker, Larry Strickland. Is Larry with us? Our next speaker is Sue Burton. Ms. Burton, if you would come forward, state your name and address. Ma'am, you will have five minutes. My name is Susan Burton. I am the current chair of Portsmouth Reads, former library director, Portsmouth Public Library. I reside at 5209 Sweetbriar Circle in Portsmouth. On March 26, 2023, Portsmouth Reads lost its founder, advocate, and constant champion, Ned McCabe. In the early 2000s, when Ned learned that over 24% of Portsmouth's children were not prepared to enter kindergarten, he decided to do something about it. Ned was a visionary who proceeded to gather interested educators, councilmen and women, reading experts, librarians, child care providers, and early childhood professionals to address the problem. The group met and strategized as to how to improve the literacy statistics and created the following vision and mission. All children in Portsmouth will graduate from high school prepared to pursue higher education or employment. All adults in Portsmouth will have the ability and resources to read. These goals would be met by creating and supporting community initiatives designed to increase the literacy skills of all preschool children and adults in the city of Portsmouth. One of the first steps was to identify funding to offer free training sessions for early childhood teachers. Child care providers in both centers and family home settings need training certification to meet state licensure's mandates. Next to parents, teachers and child care centers are often a young child's greatest educational influence. Teachers offer much of the first exposure to early learning and provide valuable help toward school readiness. Portsmouth quickly became the model for the area with these professional development workshops. Soon after, the sister cities throughout Hampton Roads would eventually replicate these training opportunities. Next, Ned enlisted Portsmouth Reads into the Raising a Reader program. Book bags were given to child care centers to distribute and to parents who attended family library nights. Parents were encouraged to read to their children 
and given easy techniques to engage with their child. This valuable resource was offered to families at no cost to them. Ned raised the money, literally going door to door to businesses and local foundations. The Infant Initiative was formed to get books and other important information into the hands of new parents while they were still in the hospital. A bag was given to them with a board book, a baby gift, and pamphlet and flyers with information on car seat safety and sleep safety for infants. Initially, these bags were taken to the Maryview Birthing Center. Presently, the bags are given to Portsmouth Health Department and Hampton Roads Community Health Center. Donations from the AKA sorority and the DAR keep these bags filled. Last but not least is the Adult Literacy Initiative. In the beginning, Portsmouth Reads supported the Tidewaters Literacy Council by funding the materials for Portsmouth tutors. When TLC folded in 12, 2012, Children's Harbor partnered with Portsmouth Reads to keep the program in place. With some initial funding by the United Way, tutor sessions would train interested volunteers to mentor Portsmouth adults who wish to gain stronger literacy skills. These one-on-one -on -one learning sessions are invaluable to the adult students who participate in the program. A strong partnership with the Portsmouth Public Library Foundation has since kept these efforts alive for the last several years. Ned's focus was always on the children. He provided such care and dedication to creating programs, resources, and conversations that would benefit Portsmouth's youngest citizens. He passionately served on the Portsmouth School Board and the Portsmouth School Foundation in an effort to serve children across the entire city. Ned also served as board president of Ida Barber Early Learning Center, listed in the United States Library of Congress archives as one of the oldest childcare establishments in Virginia. While serving as the president, he was pivotal in keeping the doors open when the center struggled financially. Ned solely sought donations and additional funding sources to cover Ida Barber Early Learning Center's monthly ex expenses. His passion for Portsmouth's youngest citizens and the legacy of Ida Barber Early Learning Center will always be remembered. May his legacy live on in the lives of young children and their families for many, many years to come. Thank you. Ms. Burton, thank you. Thank I you for sharing. Couple, I have a couple of members of the board that have attended with me, if you don't mind if they stand for just By a second. Means. We still thank have you. a board of about thank a dozen you. members. And uh, we've been going on for 20 years strong. So thank you all very much. Yes, ma'am. If you just remain, because I know Dr. Whitaker has a comment, and as does our vice mayor, and, okay. and I'll follow that up. Yes, Ms. Burton, um, thank you for sharing that information. I, I didn't realize that um, Mr. McCabe had passed. Um, somewhere between 2002 and 2014, we served on the uh, school board together. And I, I know he served when he wasn't in the best of health, but he, he showed up. And so uh, thank you for sharing with us uh, today. Yes, Ms. Burton, it's great to see you, and, and my sentiments are with Ed as well. I remember he was an advocate for Ida Barber Early Learning Center, and I have nieces and nephews that attended that, and his passion was real. I know that in the state of Virginia, they do something called a memorial resolution, but what you read sounds like a good option for a proclamation to be able to be printed up and given to his family or the board or whoever would receive it um, using those same words if um, the council would have it. Um, I have been in close communication with his mother who's uh, still alive and mm -hmm. his sisters and his brother and I will be giving her a copy of this and she wanted to make sure that you all saw when the obituary is printed which will be sometime in early June there'll be a memorial service and uh, everybody is invited who wants to share in the um, knowledge of Ned and everything that he did for the city. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Ms. Burton. I, I wasn't aware that Ned had passed either. I was aware of the work that uh, he had done, and uh, thanks for sharing that. And I'm sure there are citizens that would like to uh, donate 
to Portsmouth Reads or, or something in uh, Ned's memory? How would they go about that? Um, well, right now, Portsmouth Reads is kind of under a, a, a little arm of the Portsmouth Schools Foundation. Okay. So if they send a donation to the Portsmouth Schools Foundation, but the memo says Portsmouth Reads, then we will get that. It will also be listed in the obituary because his family was uh, very interested in making sure that uh, Portsmouth Reads was the benefactor of anything that people might want to donate. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see everybody again. Uh, hold on, Ms. Burton. Yes, ma'am. Madam Sir? City Attorney would like to say something. Now, Ms. Burton, you know I wasn't going to let you go without oh. saying something to you. I, everyone might not know this, but Ms. Burton, during her time as the head of the public library, the main branch, gave me my first job. And so it's very lovely to see her and to be uh, talking about Mr. McCabe and, and giving us this information. So I want to thank you for your service and coming to our council and giving us this information. It's nice to see you. Well, our board felt it was really critical, especially since there had not been anything in the newspaper yet. And since it is so difficult to get new, good news about Portsmouth in the newspaper, I felt like it was important that I brought this information to the uh, council. And as soon as I get a chance, I'm going to go to the school board, too. Well, Ms. Burden, as, as you know, uh, when you all did the Portsmouth Reads program at that time, my wife and I own child care centers, and I recall very vividly how Ned would show up, and it, not only would books be brought, and the parents would be excited, but dinner was provided. And, and you remember those days, and it was provided free of charge. So really all you had to do is show up, and you actually got books and a good meal, and it was all good. And one of the things I, I remember about Ned was his commitment to the community he served in a number of leadership organizations and we were able paul and i were able to attend a event for him last week by some community folks in remembering his legacy so it is grateful and we are grateful for his presence and there's an african proverb that says that memories are eternal so therefore because he will always be in our memory he will be eternally with us. Thank you. Yes, he will. In fact, I saw him the day before he passed, and believe me, he was still giving me tips on how I could get out publicity about Portsmouth Reads. <laughs> he never stopped. <laughs> Thank Councilman, you hold on. Councilman Tillich has something. Uh, Thank yes, you, sir. Mayor. Um, Ms. Burton, one of the first people I met um, when I was working for uh, Senator Lucas um, back in 2017 was Ned. And so he was very passionate um, about education. And at that time, he was um, with the uh, Ida Barber Learning Center mm -hmm. and making sure that money was being raised appropriately. Mm -hmm. And when I didn't answer that phone, he would come vi pay me a visit uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that um, edu early literacy was near and dear to his heart. And so I'm glad to see Portion 3 continuing um, his legacy and making sure that as many children as possible, regardless of their demographic, are able to achieve that level of literacy. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, appreciate it. You're welcome. Our next speaker is Ms. Angela Britt. Ms. Britt, you will come forward, state your name and address. You will have five minutes. Heavenly Father, again, we give the praise and honor. We thank you for today. Give us an ear to hear and an eye to see. I'm here today to address gun violence, resources for violence, victims of gun violence. Let me put my glasses on. Resources for families of gun violence and the impact of mental illness address under the children. Each act of violence brings pain that spreads within the community, where families and loved ones are unsure how to move forward after this tragedy. There needs to be services, programs, and supports 
groups for families who have been directly impact, in, impacted by the gun violence. This tragedy act of violence directly affects the children who have been left behind after the death of a loved one. The mental impact of this tragic incident, which in part affects the well-being in the family structure, emotional, intellectual, social ability to move forward with recovery and the healing process, unaddressed trauma within the children. I'm here today to address the gun violence pandemic in the city of Portsmouth, asking the city council to help bring awareness by coming together with other organizations to move the city forward. Not the 12 nonviolent groups, 757 groups we have in the city, but other organizations such as United Way, Crime, uh, Specialist Units, Commonwealth Attorney, their hom homicide support groups, Samaritan House, and regional law enforcement. The aim is helping victims that have been uh, directly impacted by gun violence, providing services such as licensed therapists and counselors for these who are also qualified along with private agencies. This will address the mental health impact and concerns within the family structure and the children who have been left behind. If these unaddressed trauma is not directly dealt with, the next generation of children will grow up with, again, mental health concerns. As we know, gun violence are rapid within the United States. We know that if we do not do something in reference to mental health, that the next generation will be affected. Lots of time on the news after you've seen these tragedies. The latest one was in Texas, eight shot, seven, eight killed, seven shot. Uh, injured. Uh, unfortunately, um, each after each case, they always states that this person had a mental illness problem or disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar, whatever the case may be. And as a uh, grandparent of a child who have been killed through gun violence, uh, I'm looking at my nieces and nephews. Uh, we are in counseling, and it's hard. I'm also addressing the families who cannot afford the counseling. And, and the city council, I would like to know, do you guys have programs, services, or support groups for these families who have been affected directly with gun violence? After the, love, the loss of a loved one, a sister, a brother, a nephew, a niece, these kids got to be able to deal and, and cope with this illness. And unaddressed trauma does affect the mental illness and the overall of the wellness for these kids. So I would like to know, counselors, are there any programs in effect today that we can refer these families to who, who down the road will be suffering from some type of mental illness? Ma'am, the city does have services provided uh, within, in, within our city. And so what I would ask you to do after your time is up, to please get with Ms. Bernadette Hogg, and she will instruct you on how to access some of those services. Great. Well, do you have a, a licensed counselor therapist? Ma'am, uh, she has that information. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Mr. Gary. Oh, Dr. Whitaker, sir, I'm sorry. Yeah, but, um, that, that is a relevant issue as far as the counseling. How is that made known to the public as far as services that are available? Um, I guess that's to the interim city manager. Madam city manager, do you want to speak to that? I can, and I can also provide. I think we've had that conversation came up once before of how they advertise the services with behavioral health. Um, I know they have outreach. I know they advertise it on their website. We yeah. have since then worked with public safety to determine, and the schools, to see how we can reach parents, reach the children, do assessments. So to answer your question, there are several methods that we use, but we're actually doing 
uh, more outreach as well. And we're working with the schools and the local uh, public safety departments to try to figure out how to make expand that even more. Okay. At, at our next council meeting, if um, there's no objection from council, if that could be reported back, the report back from uh, Ms. Hodge as far as what's available, uh, I think that's something good to help keep it for the public. Yes, what's, what Ms. Terry had recommended, she will ask Mr. Woodard, the uh, Dr. Woodard, the, the director of our behavioral health services uh, division here in the city uh, to come forward and explain that out okay. in public and, and provide the information. Okay. And okay. also, and, and just to piggyback off of that, we did a lot with that during the empowerment work sessions that he had an opportunity to come out and speak uh, to all of the different services that the city provides for mental health and mm -hmm. behavioral health. Mm -hmm. But we'll come back at the next meeting. Okay. Thank you, sir. Councilman Barnes, sir, you have the floor. And as far as the advertising method, um, I'm not sure if we are, but um, social media is um, a way that we can get those things out there. But also, I know we send things through our water bills. Um, if we can send it out through there to let people know the services that we provide so that they can be aware of these things. Thank you, sir. Vice Mayor Lucas Burke, ma'am, you have the floor. Yes, same as my colleagues uh, Whitaker and Barnes um, about getting the information out. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, mm -hmm. and if we're going to have uh, Dr. Woodard to come back, I think we had this deja vu same time last year. Mm -hmm. I said May was mental, uh, mental Health Awareness Month. If we could just put something on, I mean, just, you know, if it's just blue ribbons or whatever the, the color is and just, you know, some kind of uh, flyer, just, just awareness, because when it's cancer awareness, we all wearing pink and we putting out information and, you know, there's other things. So, you know, this is something that's prevalent in our community and it's the root cause of a lot of things that we're seeing uh, with uh, uh, some of our crime and some of our, our gun violence. So if Dr. Woodard or somebody from his team could come with a big poster and just some kind of flyer, balloons, whatever, um, that would be appreciated. Thank you all. Our next speaker is Mr. Gary Bunting. Mr. Bunting, if you state your name and address, sir, you will have five minutes. All right. I have copies of some letter, of a letter. Could I give it to the council members? Sergeant Abrams, please. Okay. And if you would please bring the mic up to you so we can hear you, sir. All right. Um, my name is Gary Bunting. Um, I live at 416 K Road. Um, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. Um, I'm also uh, Chairman of the Board of Zoning Appeals, and I'm coming to you on behalf of the Board of Zoning Appeals. Um, the letter that I distributed was drafted before our March meeting, and uh, the consensus of the entire board was that we move forward with um, letting the issue that I'm going to talk about uh, be known uh, so we can try to get some kind of a les resolution. I'll just go over some of the highlights of, of what's in the letter. Over the past several years, the Board of Zoning Appeal has received numerous variance requests from owners of uh, narrow residential lots requesting relief from the setback requirements, particularly side setbacks, in order to build homes that uh, within the confine, confines of these lots. The majority um, of these lots are 25 to 30 foot wide lots, which was the norm when these neighborhoods were originally developed. At the time, the zoning ordinances or the lack thereof um, allowed for homes to be built on these narrow lots. However, as zoning ordinances have been up, updated over the years, the setback requirements have been increased. Currently, the minimum side yard setback in the UR and URM zoning districts, which is where most of these lots are, is seven feet on each side, which means that you can only build a house that's 11 feet wide. Um, the requirement to build extremely narrow houses on these lots generally makes building on these lots unfeasible, and it basically makes these lots unusable. There's really no um, legitimate use that you, there's really nothing you can build on them. 
Therefore, in an effort to build homes uh, that are desirable and marketable to the public, property owners have submitted many variance rec applications requesting relief from the setback requirements. Some of these variances have been improved, but some have been denied. The Virginia Code lists five requirements that must be satisfied in order for a variance to be approved. <coughs> Item three states that the condition or situation of the property concerned is not of so general or recurring a nature as to make reasonably practicable the formulation of a general regulation to be adopted as an amendment to the ordinance. Given the number of variance applications we've received and the fact that there are many more of these lots in the city, um, it seems to me that um, this would indicate that these, the circumstances surrounding these resident, narrow residential lots are of so general a, a nature as to make reasonably practicable the formulation of a general regulation. There's a number of benefits that could be accomplished with an amendment to the zoning ordinance. Among those, it would give consistency in application of the zoning ordinance. Uh, second, because these lots are essentially unbuildable, many of them are neglected by their owners. So allowing development on these lots would rid the neighborhoods of an eyesore in many of these cases. Um, the ability to build homes on these smaller lots would provide for a more affordable housing options. New homes would provide increased tax revenue over what, we are, what are currently unbuildable lots. When the Board of Zoning Appeals receives numerous variance applications for the same reason, it's the duty of the Board of Zoning Appeals to notify City Council so that they consider, can consider whether a zoning ordinance amendment would be desirable. <clears throat> Considering the number of variance requests that we've received for setback relief on nar narrow residential lots, <coughs> excuse me, the Board of Zoning Appeals feels that this situation requires our notification of the issue. Therefore, the Board of Zoning Appeals respectfully requests that the City Council review the issues regarding narrow residential lots and consider amendments to the zoning ordinance that will address this situation. Thank you. Thank you sir. Councilman Hugel, sir, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, and thanks, Mr. Bunting, for coming tonight. Uh, so we considered, a, I don't know, several weeks ago, several meetings ago, a collection of zone, zoning ordinance changes I mentioned during that discussion that as the council liaison to the Planning Commission, I had the opportunity to sit through three separate readings of the, that uh, collection of zoning ordinances. Uh, it, it was also mentioned during Planning Commission that, that uh, perhaps the Planning Commission uh, should uh, be consulting with the Board of Zoning Appeals to to ask the question, are there things that the Board of Zoning Appeals regularly sees and, and has to deal with, uh, so that, that as we're considering changes to the zoning ordinance, we, we uh, are addressing uh, not, not just the things that the planning department identified, but also the things that keep uh, showing up at, at the Zoning Appeals Board. Uh, and so I guess I would ask uh, Madam City Manager, uh, I think we're supposed to revisit that collection of uh, zoning ordinance changes at our next council meeting. Uh, whether we have time to figure out how to deal with this one between now and then or not, uh, I'd, I'd ask you to, to uh, have the planning department take a look at uh, this specific issue and then the broader issue uh, to to uh, consult with the Board of Zoning Appeals and find out is this the only issue that they consistently see or are there others because if you see it once you deal with it if you see it twice you deal with it three times is a trend and I think Mr. Bunting is saying it's way more than three times so so this issue in particular is, um, is we're, we're past the trend line. If I could just say one thing 
the meeting, this past meeting, we had six cases of this exact item, and this coming meeting we have two cases, and that's been you know the last recent history that's been we've had quite a few. Well, well, Mr. Bunning, I think we appreciate you bringing that to our attention, and I would be in agreement. And I think the best way to approach this, certainly as we go forward, is to get with the manager and the zoning and to come up with those those pieces of information so that everything can be laid out on the table, perhaps for consideration of if any changes are required to meet the standard. So I think ongoing contact the manager in her office, and we can also make this probably a work session that will enable us as a council to be more informed as well. So thank you for bringing that to our attention, and I would just ask that you go with the manager and her staff to set up a time. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Sharon Anderson. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I am Sharon D. Anderson, and the president of the Ebony Heights Civic League. I'm here tonight as a friendly reminder, asking you all to please join us for our Civic League meeting on Monday, May 15th at 7 p.m. at New Community Temple 3615 Taranek Road in Churchland in the city of Portsmouth. This is our final meeting for our Safe Summer Initiative for the youth in the city of Portsmouth, better known as CORES, keeping our youth safe. With this initiative, we will offer positive engagement, fun, and a safe place for our youth. So I'm asking you all to please come on out and join us and partner with us, and let's create a safe place for our youth over the summer. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Garland Alexander. So if you come forward, state your name and address, you'll have five minutes. Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council, members of, members of City Council and City Manager. I live at 2913 Tanbark Lane, Portsmouth. My name is Garland Alexander. Sometimes known by some council members of persons of means. I want to thank you on behalf of, of the city retirees. There's no, over 900, somebody said there was only a few, a prior speaker, over 900 retirees in the old systems for your support. I, I assure you I have not been asking for myself. There are many widows and retirees who really need help, such as a widow who lives in Truxton and is 86 years old. She receives her uh, 86 years old with medical problems. She receives about $10,000 a year. We have, we have made it possible for her and others to, to have a better life. Thank you, and as far as HRA is, that was open to everybody that was put out of the system in 2015. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker is Mr. Merle Rutledge. Mr. Rutledge, come forward, state your name and address. Sir, you have five minutes. Hello, my name is Merle Rutledge. I live at 2024 Republican Avenue, Conservative, Virginia, 23324. I guess that woke y'all up, didn't it? As I was at the Shea um, Civic League meeting, looking at the reality of what Portsmouth State of the Union is compared to what was said that a fancy ball looked nice. And I would encourage those to add on for mental health services because it may be needed. Add on some fireworks. Add on some ice cream. Add on a fancy part. Mental health crisis 
is aware to us all every single day, even after this pandemic to now. And what I see every single day is people who could care less, care less. Now, the city manager, no offense, you brought some great ideas to reach out to the community. We planned the family community dinner. Paid our deposit. Nobody told us it was a problem. We want citizens of all backgrounds and walks of life to remember what family dinners was like on Sunday. Great food, great conversation. If there was a problem, we brought it to the table. That was that strong conservative wisdom. That was actually strong uncles and aunts, grandfathers and grandmothers, mothers and fathers. But that was denied to me. But certain politicians was able to go around city council, go straight to the city manager, and was able to have the same events while constant stage exploiting the blood of our children. Seems good, because I don't see where they're at now. I'm here. I'm here still talking every single day to every single resident about the reality of things. People are ignoring the problem because they're scared of it. A lot of communities that were safe right now are experiencing the problems that they didn't used to have to. People are scared of this world because they don't know what they're going to wake up to next. That would cause mental health crisis in the person that is the most sane but we spend more time being politicians instead of real people. Maybe we are the ones with mental health crisis, not the people we serve. The reality, people, we are facing one of the biggest crises that we have ever seen or imagined. It's time for y'all to tell the truth to the people. Tell the truth. I can see as clean red signs all over the place, blue signs talking about, oh, we could fight for the problem, we could do this. We got 200 banks about to close. We got a casino right now that is supposed to be fruitful, and that's going to probably decline probably in a year, probably close down less than that. We got people who used to be part of the middle class, be able to retire on Social Security. Now their rent is sky high. We are moving out the people who are law-abiding citizens, and we are bringing in who? Not Portsmouth. See, if we had paid more attention to the problems and made sure the safety net was taken care of, we wouldn't have these issues. But now we have police telling us 911 still don't work. Let me bring up that problem. Now the call, keep calling, keep ringing. Hopefully somebody picks up. Now as you getting shot at, killed, raped, let's bring it all up. You gonna be able to keep dialing 911? That should have been a priority, people. Should have been a priority. Talk to another police officer. I'm like, are y'all hiring more police officers? Well, nice little crack of a smile. But he was telling the truth. He was telling the truth. We don't have more police officers because he asked me that I want to become a cop. Y'all might as well get ready to deputize citizens to defend themselves as we speak. Y'all don't have years, you have months. That's the truth. Months, maybe less. Because a lot of businesses closed down within the next day. Some that was supposed to be up here for a year. And until we all start really sitting down and really addressing the problem, not making more awareness, not making more little cheerleader shows, people want action, people. And we don't have enough counselors. That's the, real, the reality. We don't have enough mental health counselors. Nobody wants to work in the business because they need their own mental health crisis. So people, if y'all want to tell Portsmouth the truth on how to fix these problems, you need to first tell them all the deficiencies that have come with it. You can tax people to death. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, That's sir. Great. Before we, we adjourn the meeting, I want to take a moment to, on behalf of the city council, to wish all of the mothers in the audience, I believe Mother's Day is Sunday. Happy Mother's Day, and I hope you have an enjoyable, safe, and wonderful weekend. Seeing no other business to conduct. Also want to uh, do a shout out for Teachers and Nurses Appreciation Week. So teachers and nurses, we applaud you um, in this week. Thank you, Vice Mayor, for keeping us honest. No more business to conduct.
This concludes our meeting. It is adjourned.